Mm. Welcome, 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 everybody, uh, to DAG's monthly meeting for March uh, 2023, as we're talking about framing the future of the Roundhouse. Um, as, as some of you will know and remember when we're in person, we all go around and introduce ourselves. So uh, we've been doing that over the chat here. So if you could introduce yourselves in the chat. And uh, since we're here talking about a um, historic building, put in your favorite Philadelphia historic building to go with your, uh, with your introduction there so we can see a few of those. Um, my name is Eli Storch. I chair the Design Advocacy Group. Um, and we like to start our meeting off with any announcements, events, any advocacy items that folks are working on around the city. So if you have anything you want to share with the group, please put it in the uh, put it in the chat, either links or information, and I can either call it out or ask you to unmute and tell us a little more about it. Um, a few quick reminders, please keep yourselves muted throughout the meeting. Uh, helps our audio quality. And if you're having technical difficulties, um, feel free to message me and I will do my best to uh, to help you out with, with anything there. Um, so jumping right in, um, why don't we uh, talk about a couple of upcoming events. Um, the DAG, uh, DAG has been working with the group uh, call, who's calling ourselves Build Philly. Um, Build Philly has been assembling uh, a mayoral forum. That's sort of the the running list of events uh, includes a lot of uh, mayoral forums this time of year, and this is focused on the built environment. And we have uh, a great number of folks who've been contributing, Preservation Alliance, ULI, uh, the AIA has been taking the lead, G uh, GBU, a whole bunch of folks. So I'm going to put some. Uh, I'm going to put the ticket link in the chat. So if you're interested in in joining that, coming out uh, in person on Tuesday, March 14th next week. Uh, please come join us. There's a few tickets left, so we'd love to have um, more people uh, taking part in that. <clears throat> also, uh, recently, I guess it was two days ago, AIA's magazine Context came out for the for the season. Um, I served as the editor for that, and it is exclusively focused on the mayoral election with advice for the mayor about uh, the new mayor and all the mayoral candidates uh, about what they should be doing and thinking and adding to their platforms about uh, the built environment. So check that out. Some, many of you will have it ma mailed to you. Uh, it'll be up on a link soon, um, and we'll share that uh, through the DAG forum. Uh, in terms of upcoming DAG events, Marsha, do you want to jump in and tell us about what DAG has coming up? Sure, Eli. Well, good news. Uh, next month's program uh, will be an in-person event on April 13th at 6 p.m. at the Center for Architecture at 1216 Arch Street. Uh, specifically, the event will include a panel discussion and exhibit called Reconnecting Communities, which is a pilot program to rejoin communities that were cut off or, or split by the construction of highways such as Philadelphia's uh, Vine Street Corridor. Uh, the goal is to cap that portion of the expressway that had cut through Chinatown since the early 90s, negatively impacting uh, the neighborhood. Uh, Nando McCalley and Danielle Blake are the planners of this event. Eleanor Sharp, the executive director of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission, will serve as moderator. Uh, panelists include John Chin, uh, Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation, Paul Levy, Center City District, and uh, Chris Pachowski of the Office of Transportation, Infrastructure, and Sustainability. The discussion will be followed by a presentation by Penn's Urban Design Studio, led by Nando, Nando and Danielle. And if that's not enough, you'll then be invited to a reception that will feature the design studio's work on display in the CFA gallery. So it'll be great to see you all in person. And oh, and then on May 25th, uh, Rebecca Chan, the director of the Friends of the Rail Park, will be presenting the plan for phase two of the park. Uh, more on that will follow next month. Eli? 
Thank you. We're excited to be back in person and, and get to be, uh, be all together. I've been putting a bunch of links in the chat, so please jump in there. Although you don't need a ticket for our April event, if you could sign us, sign up and let us know, we'll, it'll help us know how many folks to uh, expect there. So uh, that would be great. Um, thank you, Marsha. So Nando, I saw you on here. Nando, do you want to jump on and talk a little bit about the urban design uh, guidelines that DAG is, is working on putting together this summer as we're, we're still getting interest and input for that, uh, for that project? I'm not hearing you, Nando, but I am going to put a, a link into the chat um, that will allow folks, if they're interested, to learn a little more um, and get in touch with Nando and myself as we're, we're putting together the program. Oh, there you are. Hey, I'm sorry, fire I was, away. I was multi, multitasking and could not find the, uh, the unmute button. Um, yeah, so we, um, this was conceived of last fall. Uh, we're pulling together um, uh, volunteers from DAG and also working with other um, uh, design firms to develop a set of urban design guidelines, advancing um, what was published in 1996 uh, by DAG, uh, which were a general urban design guideline, um, kind of um, cheat sheet. And this will be a more illustrated set of design guidelines that would be useful to RCOs as they um, discuss development in their communities. So uh, we're convening uh, meetings this coming April uh, to sort of plan for that and working with these firms will be utilizing their interns during the summer uh, to actually create that handbook. Yeah, so if you're if you're interested in taking part, uh, being part of either a, a panel of folks who are, are advising, if you have an architecture firm and are looking for something for some of your, your summer folks to work on, let us know, um, but we'll, Nando will be convening that group um, with some other folks from DAG and we will be kicking that off um, in the not too distant future. So are there any, uh, are there any other activities, announcements, events? I thank you all for, for the, uh, the introductions here in the chat. It's nice to see those coming through. Um, if there aren't any uh, events or, or other announcements, um, I think one, one thing I did wanna mention was that in addition to the $1.8 million of federal funding um, for uh, to study the capping of, of 676, which will be discussed in April, Wednesday, there was another $4 million announced for that project. So uh, it's getting attention, it's getting funding. Um, thank you to Nando and Danielle for, for leading our, our program in April with, with uh, the folks at Penn. Um, and we'll we'll dig in there in person. So so come out and join us. Um, so let's dive in uh, to our our monthly program here because we've got a great panel of folks. Um, I'm gonna introduce all three of them and then uh, give them each a chance to to open us up and and begin uh, the conversation. And then there will be a a moderated Q and A. So throughout any of the presentation, please throw questions in the chat. Um, and I'll make sure to get to as, as many of them as we possibly can. So kicking us off um, today, we have Ian Litwin. Uh, Ian's the project manager for the Framing the Future of the Roundhouse project. Uh, he's the central district community planner in the art and design of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. Um, his work guides change and adaptation in Philadelphia's urban core through human-centered urban design and creative placemaking. Um, in addition to working for the city of Philadelphia, Ian has experience as a planner and urban designer for both large and small private sector planning and architecture firms. Uh, he is a former LRK member, so I, I can throw that in there. Uh, Ian received a Master of City and Regional Planning from the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University. So thank you to Ian for joining us. We also have Andy Toy. Uh, Andy is the policy director uh, right now, uh, sorry, my computer is having a moment. Uh, and Andy's the policy director for the Philadelphia Association of Community Development Corporations. 
uh, PACDC, uh, whose mission is working with CDCs to create an equitable city where every Philadelphian lives, works, and thrives in a neighborhood that offers an excellent quality of life. Uh, Andy previously served as the Community Development and Communications Director for CMAC, the Southeast Asian Mutual Assistance Associations Coalition, whose mission is to support and serve immigrants and refugees and other politically, socially, and economically marginalized communities as they seek to advance the conditions of their lives in the United States. Uh, Andy successfully led the conceptual plan effort for Mifflin Square Park, uh, moving towards implementing a $4.2 million improvement. And Andy and his team also managed the uh, South Philadelphia East Food Truck Immigrant Chef Incubator, which engages and connects community through food and culture. And our, our third panelist uh, today is uh, Paul Steinke. Paul serves as the Executive Director of the Preservation Alliance for Greater Philadelphia, a membership-based organization whose mission is to promote the appreciation, uh, adaptive reuse, and development of, Philadelphia, of the Philadelphia region's historic buildings, communities, and landscapes. I uh, started this role in June 2016 after serving on the organization's board of directors for many years. Prior to that, uh, Paul served as the general manager of the Reading Terminal Market for 13 years, uh, where he oversaw numerous improvements in the facility and tenant mix. Uh, in 2014, the market was recognized by the American Planning Association as, as one of the great places in America. So enough of me talking. Um, Ian, Thank you for, for leading us off. Uh, I, will, I will pass it over to you to, to get after it. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Eli, for the very nice introduction. Uh, like Eli said, I'm Ian Litwin. I work for the city's Department of Planning and Development, uh, and I was project manager for the Framing the Future of the Roundhouse Project. Uh, the final report for this project uh, is currently being translated. Um, so it's complete, it's just not released because we're gonna release it in Spanish and simplified Chinese as well. Uh, so I'm just gonna go over what we did uh, in our process and then I'm gonna hand it over to, to Andy and Paul. Uh, so the Department of Planning and Development recognizes and acknowledges the role of the planning profession in creating and perpetuating racial inequity. Uh, when the police moved to North Broad Street, a window was opened for the city to examine how the roundhouse site could better serve the community and possibly redress some of the harm caused by urban renewal. So we started um, with an active, intentional listening and engagement process uh, that we called Framing the Future of the Roundhouse. Uh, we worked with a group of artists, designers, and engagement specialists to gather input from Philadelphians um, on the... The uh, two uh, main consultants on this project were Connect the Dots Insights and Amber Art and Design, uh, and this team was selected uh, through an RFP process uh, last year. Uh, so the Roundhouse was designed uh, to inspire a professional community service oriented police department. Uh, as you know, before the Roundhouse, uh, the police were in the basement of City Hall, and this move was designed to create distance between politicians and the police. However, in the intervening 60 years, it came to symbolize the brutalities of urban renewal and discriminatory policing practices. Uh, its rounded form was intended to convey a softer police presence, while the generous front entry plaza signaled welcome to the community. Uh, the architect's progressive objectives were never fully realized, as the police department added a concrete perimeter wall shortly after the building's completion. Uh, they also moved the main entrance to the rear of the building off the parking lot. Uh, so we hope that the future of this site is one that can bring Philadelphians together, uh, and we will work with our greatest resource, our residents, to achieve this end. Uh, so the Roundhouse was a product of Philadelphia's 20th century urban renewal efforts. Uh, you can see on the slide here, there's an aerial from 1959 uh, to, to 2022, and you can see uh, how the urban renewal projects um, hollowed out this area. Um, so the Vine Street Expressway, the Roundhouse, and the Pennsylvania Convention Center displaced and disrupted large numbers of residents and businesses in Chinatown and adjacent communities, resulting in cum cumulative community impacts. So for many Philadelphians, uh, the Roundhouse is a symbol of harm caused by urban renewal and police misconduct. Uh, the police department's strained relationship with minority groups was on display as recently as 2020, during the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, this image here is the police and the National Guard uh, protecting the building um, 
during those clashes. Um, and then for others, the curved concrete structure is an architect architectural and engineering, engineering milestone worthy of preservation. Uh, the design of the Red House was a collaborative effort uh, between the architects and Estonian American engineer August Commandant. Uh, the building was one of the first constructed using an innovative Dutch system called shock baton. Uh, you'll hear more about the architecture and engineering uh, from Paul. So what we found um, through our engagement is that roundhouse stories are painful and hopeful. They're painful for, pe for people who worked or were detained there and hopeful for people who saw innovation in architecture and construction come to life here. Uh, the building holds both of these perspectives simultaneously and discounting either would be a disservice to Philadelphia. Uh, so our consultant team came up with a, a methodology um, and it was designed to engage both with Chinatown and the entire city at large. Um, the engagement process focused on naming and framing the lived experiences of people connected to the roundhouse and launching meaningful placemaking uh, for healing. So these were the five questions that guided the engagement. Um, meaningful placemaking uh, uncovers values and memories of a space and connects those memories to other memories that branch out from the site and connect to the community. Uh, and our main goal here is um, to build community uh, and possibly uh, do what the roundhouse was originally intended to do. So we used a number of uh, engagement methods uh, partially due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also because we were trying to reach the city as a whole and we only had six months to do it. Um, so outreach took place during June and December of last year, both in person and online. Uh, the project team hosted a series of events and pop-ups throughout the city, from Kensington to West Passchunk, King Sessing to Cherry Street Pier. The pop-up events allowed us to meet with people where they are. Uh, Spanish and Chinese interpreters were on hand uh, at the events. We also had an interactive web page uh, where the public could submit anonymous stories, insights, opinions, and ideas uh, for the site's future. Uh, these are just some images uh, from the outreach events, including the one we held on the steps of the roundhouse itself. Uh, the engagement team also included a group of youth ambassadors uh, between ages 16 and 21, uh, and their task was to organize their peers and communities. Uh, they held six events, uh, creating a safe space for conversations about the meaning of the roundhouse to the lives of Philadelphia youth and their families. Uh, so the forthcoming report will summarize what we heard from Philadelphians, uh, but in general, uh, we found that when people think about stories related to the roundhouse, they think about the building. The building by design does not look like its surroundings, and over time, the police and the building have become inextricably linked in the minds of most people. Um, when people think about how to move forward, they think about the role of the site in the future of the neighborhood. People tended to see the site's urban design and not the building's architecture as the main issue. The wall and the surface parking lot are seen as anti-urban uh, and detrimental to the surrounding community. There was widespread support for tearing down the concrete wall around the building and reducing the amount of asphalt uh, in the parking lot. Uh, for those who were indifferent to the preservation or demolition of the roundhouse, uh, they emphasize the need to heal the wounds associated with the building. Uh, and this quote from one of our participants sums it up nicely. Quote, it was a place of oppression, but the ideals of the architect were to make it airy and progressive. We can restore that purpose, connect the buildings to the park, and make it light and airy. Let's bring back the idealist roots. Uh, so transformation of the building could lead to healing by reconnecting the building to the community. Uh, and the values most often cited were to create a positive public benefit and to build community. Uh, most people proposed mixed use redevelopment. The most common proposal for the future of the site was for affordable housing. Uh, people were also interested in repurposing the property for community uses. Uh, people cited everything from a recreation center to a museum to a, a community event space. Uh, so uh, the report will make four recommendations. Um, the removal of the concrete walls surrounding the building an addition of green space was a priority for the community. Uh, the future of the site should be open to the public. Um, the public needs the painful past that is linked with the police to be acknowledged. Um, we know that uh, repurposing this building or redeveloping the site cannot heal the wounds associated um, with these things, but uh, it's a step in the right direction. And incorporating youth programs or recreation into the site 
would provide a place for young people to gather and help make the site a place of healing. Uh, and lastly, the selected redevelopment team should continue to involve the public in the development of the roundhouse. Uh, so there's two next steps, um, but we have no hard timeline for these. Uh, so the goal of this process will be to balance the community perspectives uh, with the need for economic development and historic preservation. Uh, the Roundhouse was nominated to the Philadelphia Historic Re Register of Historic Places in 2022. Uh, the nomination will be considered by the Historic Commission, the Historical Commission this year. Uh, and then we do plan on uh, entering into a disposition process. Uh, the rebuilding of the Roundhouse is an important step in knitting the area back into the physical and social fabric of the city. Uh, the, prop the city will begin uh, the property disposition process by issuing an RFP. Um, no date has been set for that. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Paul and Andy. Yeah, I think the physical and social fabric of the city is a good place for, for Andy to jump in. Um, Andy, do you wanna share your screen and and, uh, and uh, take it from here? Sure. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, so before I start, I probably should just give some context, more context to um, where I'm coming from. First of all, um, failed to mention you might not have seen but i was the chair of uh, the chinatown development corporation and i was in front of for about five years and i was involved in pcbc for about 25 so i'm really happy about the reconnecting uh chinatown across vine street um something we've been working on for decades really so um and i look at the roundhouse as a part of that as well um uh because if you look back at um ian's pictures um, the one from before, there were there were houses there. There were people living on this site and across the street, uh, which became Metropolitan Hospital as well. Um, let me just. Yeah, um, so um, just as well, um, part of the context is I also I was also part of the um, framing of the future of the roundhouse. I appreciate being invited to that and I appreciate um, being asked to present here as well, being part of this conversation. Um, and I had sent out a little blurb uh, that I'll read right here that might be helpful. Um, so I said, uh, like other publicly built buildings that have outlived their previous uses, the future of the roundhouse must be considered in the context of the community in which it sits. Chinatown is an important neighborhood in Philadelphia that has been impacted by many public projects and even pro private projects while remaining resilient and improving from its days as an undesirable place uh, with quote unquote skid row extending to Independence Mall. Like any important community, the needs and context of Chinatown deserve to be considered first when considering the future of the roundhouse. Does the current site and design fit well into the existing urban context or should it be changed? So to reframe the conversation, in my opinion, how can this site and the rat house best serve the future of the community. So when I talk about the community, it's the closest community first, um, not necessarily uh, the whole city first, but um, how this site was taken basically uh, by the public and turned into a, a police administration building, uh, which of course there's a lot of trauma in that uh, and not to, um, uh, downplay that, but but really what is what is the context of the future of the roundhouse? Um, so really from a design perspective, um, and, and everybody knows what it looks like, but you can see how far away it is from the street, um, especially the middle of the building, which is really where the entrance has been uh, or should have been, um, is way, way off the street. Um, and if you look at uh, Chinatown in general, um, it's it's a place where everything is up at the street level, uh, straight up to the property line, uh, ground floor commercial, upstairs residential. Um, if this if this building could be, and and you know I've had conversations with Paul, and thank you Paul for um, you know informing me uh, more than um, I was before that maybe there are ways to improve this building and make it. Um, a better feel for how it connects the community to this site, but also to Franklin Square, which is also very disconnected to the community, has been by Metropolitan Hospital and the uh, police administration building. Um, 
uh, and yeah, I'm just going to show a couple slides just to, uh, you know, brutalism. Uh, it's a terrible word, but um, it is it is a design uh, with lots of um, concrete and um, solidness to it. Um, and uh, my least favorite building, um, Austin City Hall, um, is a good example of brutalism in, in, in the United States. Um, I used to live not far from there and never went in there because it was just a terrible looking place and a very cold and, and oppressive, um, kind of like uh, the power of government is too big and you can't go in there. Um, that's the design side of it. Um, a, another thing is um, in terms of design, can it, looking forward, um, can it be used for residential above, perhaps? Um, and so, you know, I'm not totally against, I guess, at one point I talked to Inga Saffron and said we should blow the thing up, um, and, and she freaked out. But um, I actually, uh, if, if there's a way to preserve it and to preserve, um, but, but to make it more connected and engaging to the street uh, face, then I... I you know, could see that that might work, but if if it becomes a historically certified building, it makes it much much harder to do anything uh, to change the out, outside uh, envelope. Um, I think it should be brought out to Race Street to the the the, the, the this area that's right now like a bike lane. I think um, it it should really be uh, right at the street level, and there should be some sort of activity there, uh, stores or restaurants or whatever, and then upstairs, uh, residential would be great. The issue, I think, in terms of design is that the cores, those three, I guess, areas are where all the um, utilities uh, reside. So I don't know how you put bathrooms into each unit if you had residential. There's a, there's some issues in design, um, which I guess with enough money could be overcome. Uh, and engineering um, more importantly i think from my point of view it's it's about the, the community uh the history of the community being basically overrun by projects um that that um you know are good for the the city but i think the the community has been um undervalued for many years um and underheard for many years um and it's time that um, we really incorporate um, the growth of the community here. Uh, there's a great need for affordable housing, um, you know, and with the potential arena, there will be a, a need for um, growth in this in this direction as well. Um, and so I really, that's the bottom line is it, it should be something that is thought of in, in the context of uh, the community and basically, and actually across the street diagonally is where um, there is a planning for uh, some other development, uh, which is a very, very difficult site to build on because of the um, the, um, the commuter rail tunnel and um, the Broad Street uh, spur um, of the Broad Street line and a giant sewer line that go, runs through that site. That's why that site's been a parking lot for so many years. Um, but if that site got developed and the roundhouse site were developed, um, I think we could have a really great uh, uh, area right here that connects us better to Franklin Square, which is right on the upper left side of this uh, picture. Um, and I think that's really the focus. Oh, and here's a, just a picture of what Chinatown, of course, you all know, know what it looks like um, with a lot of activity on the street, people walking around, a lot of, uh, retail um, and upstairs residential. And that's really what um, makes it so vibrant. And um, if we can figure out a way to, to make that happen at the site, great. If not, I would say maybe it needs to be rethought to, to be more in line with um, the, the context of the community, how, project, uh, how real estate is being developed right now in the community. Um, so I think that's my last slide, yeah. And that's- Why don't, 
Yeah, why don't we have Paul jump in, uh, give us a little more context on, on the architecture and, and the history here. Um, I see there's some, some comments coming in on the chat uh, that, we'll, that we will definitely address, uh, David Geddes in particular. Um, please put some questions in there and make sure you're, uh, you're adding to those. We'll, we'll address them all, but Paul, why don't you take it away? Great, Eli. Thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Steinke from the Preservation Alliance for Greater Philadelphia. And I want to first uh, uh, express a note of appreciation for Ian's presentation and uh, summarizing the results of the framing the future of the Roundhouse project over the past year. Uh, really encouraged by some of the uh, conclusions that are uh, that he shared. So thank you for that, Ian. Thank you for your and the Department of Planning and Development's work on that for the past year. It was a very impressive exercise and I think very impactful in determining the future of this site. Uh, and a note of appreciation to Andy as well. Andy's a longtime friend and confidant. Uh, we agree on a lot, we disagree on a little, uh, but we always do it respectfully. And I, I really appreciate his eloquent um, defense of Chinatown's uh, interests here and uh, their long, fight to preserve their cultural heritage in the middle of a dense uh, center city environment. So, um, you know, we, the Preservation Alliance wants to save the roundhouse. Uh, and I think the question is, but why? Why save this building? Uh, and that's a question that may be on a lot of people's minds. Uh, and before I move forward, I want to acknowledge on the call, David Geddes, who is the son of the architect of this building, Robert Geddes who passed away last month at the age of 99, uh, and also Ali Davis and Dan Macy, who are on the call uh, representing Docomomo, Philadelphia chapter, who have been our uh, strong partners in making the case for why the roundhouse should be preserved. All right, let's see if I get my slides to advance here. I have to do it this way. Let's say, here we go. So, <clears throat> The story of the Roundhouse really begins with the election of Richardson Dilworth as mayor of Philadelphia in the mid 1950s. He was part of the democratic reform duo of Clark and Dilworth who took power in the 50s uh, and tried to um, in institute more progressive ideas of city government uh, at, at a time when we had had one party rule for about 60 years. Meanwhile, uh, the, uh, in 1956, Philadelphia architect Robert Geddes was part of a team that won second prize in the competition to build a new opera house in Sydney, Australia. Uh, second prize never gets built, but it earned them a lot of respect around the world. Um, and uh, they were Philadelphia-based architects. And back in Philadelphia, we had Mayor Dil Dilworth. Uh, who stood for progressive ideals of city government, as I mentioned, um, and sought to use the new modern architectural style to bring government out of the shadows and into accessible buildings that would allow sunlight into the halls of power, both literally and figuratively. Here he is announcing both the new municipal services building and the new police administration building. Uh, the police department had been housed, as, as Ian said, in the basement of City Hall for 60 years, just downstairs from meddling politicians in City Hall. Dilworth recognized the corruption and malpractice of the Philadelphia police and sought to move them out of City Hall into new quarters. Uh, and I want to riff here on an irony uh, with respect to City Hall, uh, because when Dilworth moved the police out of City Hall, the building was about 60 years old, the same age as the Roundhouse is today. And at that time, our City Hall was widely reviled uh, by uh, architects and by others in the city who saw it as out of style, worn out, dated, and there were even serious proposals to demolish our City Hall. Uh, and now I would say today that uh, City Hall is one of most Philadelphians' most favorite and iconic buildings. So it's interesting how tastes change 
over time. So the architecture firm of Gettys, Brecker, Qualls, and Cunningham uh, used some of the ideas that they put out there for the Sydney Opera House competition in the design of the new police headquarters uh, for Philadelphia. Uh, and Mayor Dilworth and his administration selected Getty's firm for the project. Uh, the building became known as a prominent example of the Philadelphia School of Architecture, uh, as practiced by the likes of GBQC, as we see here, uh, Venturi Scott Brown, Lou Kahn, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell Jergola, and others. Uh, I've seen some debate in the chat over the style of architecture that this building represents. Uh, we do not believe it was, it's an example of brutalism. Um, we think it is, it should be referred to as part of the Philadelphia school that took root in this city in the late fifties through uh, the early seventies. All right. So the roundhouse as it became known uh, was considered in engineering as well as an architectural model. Uh, Ian made reference to this. Um, using architectural precast concrete was a new idea at the time. And this was one of the first buildings built in the United States using that material. Um, it was called Shakbaton, a Dutch system for producing high quality architectural precast concrete. Uh, and the new police headquarters was dedicated in 1962. It was only a few years later, 1967, uh, five years after the roundhouse opened, that Frank Rizzo became police commissioner in Philadelphia. And he went on to serve two terms as mayor from 1972 to 1980. He always ran on a tough on crime stance in a city like most big American cities that was grappling with increasing social unrest and rising crime. We had the Columbia Avenue riots in 1964, anti-war protests and street crime, uh, rising rates of street crime that played into Rizzo's image as a tough guy. It reached a low point after Rizzo left office in 1985, when the police dropped a bomb on a West Philadelphia neighborhood, killing 11 people and destroying 61 homes. Later mayors and police commissioners attempted to change the practices of the police with varying degrees of success, but the damage was done. The Philadelphia police became known as a brutal and racist unit, uh, a legacy that they're still trying to shake to this day. And we cannot deny that. and We cannot deny the way that uh, those practices became associated with the roundhouse, although obviously uh, that wasn't the fault of the building. And these were issues being dealt with and are still being dealt with by other cities across the country. Uh, just in the pages of the Philadelphia Inquirer today, stories about um, police brutality and uh, racist practices in the cities of Louisville and Memphis. So certainly not unique to Philadelphia and a problem that we still are working on solving. So why am I showing you this building? This is the former Provident Mutual Insurance Company building at 46th and Market Streets in West Philadelphia, built in 1927. In 1983, the company donated the building to Lincoln and Cheney Universities, two historically black uh, universities, uh, who ran the building as a center for nonprofits and small businesses. But they really couldn't sustain it. Uh, and by the turn of the 21st century, the building was worn out, empty, and the very picture of a white elephant. So in 2014, the Nutter administration broke ground on a new police headquarters to be installed in this building. But Mayor Kenny reversed course. When he took office, he rejected the idea of the police station in West Philadelphia uh, and had the police move into the former Inquirer headquarters last year which was renovated in a $260 million historic tax credit project. 
But let's go back to West Philly. The building that might have become our new police headquarters has been reborn as 4601 Market. Uh, it's a mixed use medical and education campus with uh, the behavioral health unit of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, a unit of Philadelphia Health Management Corporation, and a charter school, KIPP Charter School, have occupied this building uh, and returned it to use. And it's a beautiful historic rehabilitation project that was only completed last year. This is the vision that we would like to see take hold at uh, the Roundhouse. Beyond that, the um, 4601 Market Project uh, is also being redeveloped with 1,240 units of market rate housing in the open space surrounding the historic building, um, adding to economic development, construction jobs, life and activity to a long disinvested uh, part of West Philadelphia. Now, I know it's been in the news recently also for District Councilwoman Jamie Gautier's efforts to persuade the developer to incorporate affordable housing into this project. Uh, but again, this is a vision for what could happen um, at the Roundhouse. So we engaged uh, Tony Bracali uh, to come up with some images of what the Roundhouse site could look like if it were redeveloped with the uh, parking to the south side of the building. And this is an image that shows fully maximizing the um, zoning envelope for the site. It shows what could be possible uh, when the city sells this uh, uh, building and site, if a developer wanted to uh, redevelop it for residential office or other uses. And here's another view that shows how that could occur. Um, he also developed an image that shows a, a more low rise project. Uh, and he also incor incorporated a diagonal walkway uh, running from southwest to northeast that would open up a pedestrian path from the Chinatown neighborhood uh, through this, this property. <clears throat> so finally, uh, as Ian said, the building has been nominated for the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places. It was, the nomination was co-sponsored by Doko Momo uh, and the Preservation Alliance. And I was pleased to hear uh, Ian say that the Historical Commission will consider the nomination this year. And we look forward to that. I also want to point out that in January, the International Council on Monuments and Sites sent a letter to Mayor Kenny and also to uh, Council Member Squilla advocating for uh, the preservation of this building. Um, so I think that's gonna wrap it up for me. Uh, no, not, not quite, I do have one more. I'm gonna answer the question that I posed at the beginning of this talk. Why save the roundhouse? Well, it is an architectural and engineering landmark. Uh, some would put it up there with uh, Saarinen's TWA terminal at JFK Airport in New York, uh, along with the as-built Sydney Opera House as a building that, and others, that, as a building that really deserves consideration of one of the finest buildings of, its, of the modern era and one of the finest buildings of the Philadelphia School of Architecture. Um, designed by GBQC Architects, a firm that had and still has inter an international reputation the building is in remarkably good condition and less than 60 years old. Uh, if you go on to the Framing the Future of the Roundhouse website that Ian stewards, you can see interior photographs of some of the public spaces uh, that are surprisingly intact after 60 years of use by the police. Demolition would be a waste of multiple kinds, uh, a waste of building materials, uh, a waste of a building still in good condition, and a wasted opportunity to grapple with the legacy of police brutality. Um, and the city itself has put out um, a call for being a greener city and uh, 
re repurposing buildings were possible. There is the opportunity to redevelop uh, the surrounding open space. And finally, a unique opportunity to reclaim a place of uh, what you might call contested memory over the legacy of the Philadelphia police and this site. Uh, so Eli, with that, I will stop share and turn it back to you. Thank you, thank you all. I, I appreciate all the context that you're bringing to this. And I think a, a good place to start um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask uh, David Geddes to, to unmute and say a few words about the architectural style, seeing as you dropped some all caps on us in the chat. So I, I, have, to, I have to say hi and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, hi, you know, when I, hi, when I, when I see the building, I see, you know, this sort of where the, you know, the gridded forms of the international style meet those more concrete shell buildings you mentioned. And, you know, I think more of like a Bertrand Goldberg in, in the work in Chicago of, of what those more extruded forms ended up. Uh, but I wanted to give you a chance to, to talk about the style and how, how you understand the building. Um, I think on the architectural details, I would pat, defer to Paul Steinke and David Brownlee, who I see um, is also on the phone. Um, yeah, brutalism is, is a terrible term. I think if the term had, you know, brutal, has a heavy emotional load to it. If, if the style had another term applied to it, I think attitudes would be better. Um, brutal Brutalism really comes from the poured concrete. This building is not poured concrete. As Inga Safran described in her great January 3rd Inquirer article, um, you know, this building has all sorts of rippled forms. That's why, that's why the curved forms by Saarinen and in Sydney Opera House I think are more illustrative. Incidentally, yes, my GBQC came in second in the Sydney Opera House competition. And my dad is the first person to say they came in second for a reason because the one that won is clearly a better building. And he has an interesting article available on his website called Second Thoughts, which is exactly on that topic. I, I would just add what I said in my comment. My dad always felt that architecture should first and foremost have a, a human purpose and a civic purpose. And um, as a goal for this, this discussion really hits exactly on the point of how can you take a building and a site and really an extended site and make it serve the public need. I think he'd be delighted to hear this conversation if he could, although his he had 99 good year, 90, 98 really good years and a, a year when his memory was failing a lot. But um, Inga Safran brings out those points in her article, which I encourage you all to read. You know, question is, does the city have the vision to do something like this? Because I think a vision and a creative, a creative reuse and transformation of this site would really put, could put Philadelphia certainly on the national, if not the international map for urban planning initiatives. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate the insight. I just dropped a, a link to Inga's article in the uh, in the chat. Um, if there's any other articles that folks think are, are relevant and want to share, please please share them with the group. Um, so I think as we get in here, uh, one of the first comments that I've seen a couple times in the chat and I had for myself that I'll, I'll throw to Ian is about you know we talk about reconnecting fabric. Race Street is a highway. I mean, it's either a highway or it's a highway on ramp. You, you, you describe it, you know, how you want. But what steps can be made? What steps will be made to, to make this a more accessible part of, of the city of Philadelphia and not just a, a, a connector in order to get to 95 and 676? Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> I have to give credit to my colleagues at the city's uh, transportation office, Otis. So if you've been on Ray Street in the last few years, you will notice that it is one lane narrower than it was. Um, so there's a parking protected bike lane that was installed. Um, and there is funding to make that uh, more permanent with raised concrete islands. Um, so the, the current lane layout is less than it was and, and shorting dis uh, crossing distances will be shorter. Um, but you know, that's, that's the extent of what's on the books now. Uh, I do think it's it's part of the larger conversation that we're doing um, on the, the Vine Street Expressway. There's sort of a, a whole bunch of things that were sort of dropped on Chinatown that taken together, you know, 
really disconnect from the rest of the city. So hopefully there's more we can do, but that's what's on the, is what's planned for now. So as we move sort of out from the streets towards the building, Paul, this is probably for you. I just wanted to know if there's any history or any context about the walls and what we know about the walls and what was the reaction to the walls in the, the moment when they were being constructed, because it, it, they're an unavoidable point when you come to discuss this building is those walls and, and you know, it's hard to, you, you can't engage with the building properly because of them. So I was just wondering yeah. if there was any, any history have, information about that. It's a good question, Eli. I haven't seen any uh, kind of written documentation about the thinking uh, behind why the wall was built. But I think we can all uh, probably uh, imagine that it was because the police uh, are considered a target, a target for people who don't like them, a target uh, perhaps later in uh, the timeline for terrorists. Of course, it was put up in the 60s. Um, but I think that was the reason. It's the same reason why Independence Mall is now walled off in some places in ways that people are uncomfortable with. But I do think the wall is it's what we call a reversible alteration. Uh, a, you know, the idea behind the building was to be more accessible, to make the police have a more friendly, accessible face to the city. Uh, as Ian said, the entrance was moved around from the plaza in front to a uh, rabbit warren in the back. The wall was put up. The police went into a kind of uh, walled encampment. That does not have to be the future for this building and should not be. Uh, and so I think, you know, we all would hope that the wall would be removed. Yeah, and if you look at the, the panels of the building and then the wall itself, they're clearly two different forms of construction. They're not, they're not the same, you know, finish of concrete. So one of the biggest things we heard from everyone was like tear down the walls. So at a minimum, I think that it's safe to say that that needs to happen. Well, Andy, I don't know that you meant to do this, but we do have a, uh, a new nonprofit starting to support the design of Boston City Hall going on in the chat. So you've, you've brought out some, some true fans of, uh, of that project. Um, uh, Amanda Soss can ask a really good question. Um, meaningful placemaking can take place uh, anytime or, or sometime from now. So what is the city going to do to ensure that the roundhouse is not be going to become a vacant derelict building, um, you know, used for parking, municipal staging, and not put into to good, meaningful, temporary use during this process. Uh, so uh, I'm sure you've noticed that the, the front entrance or the original front entrance is boarded up. Um, last I was there, there is one um, uh, technology employee because some of the servers in the building are still functioning. But other than that, it is entirely empty. I think um, our original you know, plan before we decided to do the community engagement process was to sell the building. Um, that is still on the table uh, and we're trying to move as quickly as we can, but we don't want to sort of shortchange the community in this process. Um, so we're, we're proceeding sort of at the speed that we need to. Um, but uh, I don't know if, if I can give a, an answer that will will please you, but you know, the building is vacant and it's gonna remain that way. The city doesn't have any plans on moving any other city offices into it. Uh, so that's the status of the building right now. So to follow up with that on something that the city and you personally may have some, some control over as you're, you're working on the, the, on the, the RFP for the processes, will there be any commitments about activating the building and not having it continue to remain stagnant for significant periods? Will, will there be you know, timelines enforced or anything like that that you're gonna look to put into the RFP? Uh, I think that's possible. I think one of the things we're running up against is the, is the economy. I mean, if, you know, we, we don't wanna you know, release an RFP and then not get you know, good responses back. So we, we have to balance, balance sort of the, the, the need for the city to, to not own the building anymore with you know, with what the community wants and, and what this process sort of reveals. So hopefully we, we can, you know, the economy doesn't, you know, completely tank on us and, and we can find, you know, willing partners to help us with it. 
I think that's the key is that it, it, we're not simply just going to sell it. It's, it. it's more of a, you know, there's going to be strings attached of, of how we can best use it. And the more strings we put on it, you know, the less money we're going to see and the less interest we'll get. So we have to balance all that. So uh, this question's for, for Andy, but it's, it can go to anybody. Um, how has the, the thinking about this building and how it's reused and how it's, uh, how it's sold, how has that changed in your mind as we are considering a, a Sixer stadium also uh, on the edges of Chinatown? And that's another uh, significant impact to the Chinatown community. Has it affected the thinking? How, how, do, you, how do you think that? Uh, has gone. Well, I'd just like to point out, I think Paul has helped to affect my thinking a little bit. So uh, thank you, Paul, for opening up my mind a little bit more to um, this building. Um, and in fact, I, I think I like the design a lot better than I used to, but because it's sort of rounded versus like the, like the big block of concrete. Um, but again, it comes back to context. If, if this was in a different place, I think it would be great. It's a question of, can it be um, connected better to the community. Um, I would love to see something out front on this, but then like, you know, a, the building come out more, but I think that the problem would be that it wouldn't look exactly the same. And I don't know how that would run, you know, how that would run with preservationists because it's, it would be kind of a, a different, slightly different looking building, but it, it could be much more engaging at the street level, though. I think if, if we were to do that, like on the first floor, for example, instead of the plaza set back, maybe a plaza set something set forward. Um, that's just my thinking. I'm, I, you know, that's just me. Um, and in terms of the arena, yeah, it just makes it more, um, uh, you know, heightens the awareness of the the changes in the community that need to be. If we if we want if we believe that this is an important community and we want to preserve it, um, what are the most important elements? And and, and some people talk about various things, but I, um, I think it comes down to residents, residents, and people uh, having a place to come to, um, especially new immigrants. Uh, it's been the landing place for a lot of um, new people um, who are often low income and need to work in. Uh, you know, the, the retail and res restaurants in the community. So I think if we can find a way to incorporate affordable housing into the project, any project that's done um, is really critical to the future of, of the community because uh, people complain about gentrification. And yeah, it's, it's just the fact of life at that location at, at, at the edge of core of Center City, you're going to have, um, you know, uh, rental and, and housing prices go up over time. It's, it's not, and the arena is not going to be the reason why that happens by itself. It's just going to, it's, it's just a natural evolution. So I think we do need to have um, right now, especially um, a, a focus on affordable affordability because uh, we're losing projects across the city as well. Um, and uh we don't want to become San Francisco or Seattle where people uh, can't even afford to live in a, a, you know, people who are making a decent salary can't even afford to live in a, in a, in a rental unit. Um, so I think, I think that's really, um, to me, that's critical in the future. And if I could just piggyback on that, Eli, um, I agree with Andy on all of that. And I would, especially if the private market is going into hibernation for a while, um, in terms of real estate development because of interest rates and construction cost increases and so forth, I would challenge the notion that the city even has to sell this right away. Why not work with Chinatown on a redevelopment plan for the site, which the city owns, uh, that would directly address Chinatown's concerns and needs? Because if the city sells it to a private developer, they're going to, uh, by necessity, be governed by uh, generating a return. And that may not include uh, addressing Chinatown's needs. There's less control over that. Um, so I would just challenge the notion that the city would have to sell it. Um, I know that that's not for Ian to decide alone, <laughs> but that's a point I'd like to make. It's a city-owned property. 
why not solve, why not use it to solve some of the city's problems instead of just selling it off? So Ian, I'm gonna follow up on that and ask if, uh, you know, talking about selling property, if there are any lessons learned from the acquisition and sale of 4,600 market that are front of mind, you know, that, that has come up lately in terms of the amount of money invested and then the amount of money sold for on piggybacking onto what's Paul's now saying, are, are, are there any lessons learned out of 4,600 market that are, are pertinent in front of mind for you? Um, I think it's not possible for us to sort of balance the sheet for 4601 market. Uh, the city spent, spent what it spent and then there was a new administration and, and plans changed. Um, so I, I, we're not really looking at, at the roundhouse site as a, as a money maker. Sometimes when the city sells property, we're looking for higher bids. Uh, I think in this case, that's just one of many factors and it's not the most important. I think that the biggest thing we heard in this pro in this process, we didn't really hear an overwhelming desire to demolish the building. You know, when people learn about the building and its intentions and its design, you know, the thing we hear most often is like we can put it back to what it was supposed to be. And I know that you know that doesn't always line up one to one with private you know real estate interests, but the site does have a, a large surface parking lot behind it. Um, so I think there's there's ways to do it, and I would say. A better lesson for us was the, the family court building um, on the parkway. Uh, so the initial plans to sell the family court building and convert to a hotel fell through. And now there's a, uh, an RFP. We have three finalists. to It includes the parking lot behind the library as well to sort of help you know, balance you know, how much money you can make on, on a historic building. And it also requires um, a facility for the African-American Museum. So you know, I think that's a really good proxy for this and that there's a, a building, you know, that has a lot of issues. And then there's also sort of excess space in a parking lot and also requirements for uses that are not going to make the developers any money. Uh, and we have three, you know, pretty good finalists on that on that right now. And we're going through that process. So I think that might be a better proxy than, than 4601. Absolutely. No, I think that that's a great one. And um, Andy, do you want to follow up on what you said in the uh in the chat about uh, PCDC's ability to, to work in partnership? Um, yeah, just the idea that maybe there is an opportunity for a public uh, or a private nonprofit partnership. Uh, the hardest part of for nonprofits is, is really the capital um, to get a project off the ground. It took us 20 plus years to actually do the, the what's called the crane building at 10th and, and Vine. Um, and we don't want to leave it empty for 20, 30 years to try to figure out how that becomes um, viable uh, or, you know, as, as we're pulling together the financing. So I think they're either a private uh, developer in, in partnership, but actually is a partnership, as Paul was saying, where there is a voice of, um, you know, there is a strong community connection and uh, the needs of the community are, are are part of that, um, are embedded in the project. Well, we'll next be in person with, with John Chin next month for our DAG meeting. So we can all, we can all tell him to, to get on that. If, if he's not, <laughs> as I assume he may. Another project, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Craig Shelter, I see you got your hand up. Do you wanna, do you wanna say, uh, you wanna ask a question? Uh, I wanna make a comment. Um, I think one of the things that needs to be considered here is to involve PIDC in the process of feeling out some developers who are really capable of thinking broadly about the building, both in terms of a private return and getting some funds generated to get some of the public uses that you want in there. And I'm thinking Lindsay Scanapico, who took over the Bach Technical High School in South Philadelphia and has been, done a tremendous job bringing that building back online. I think the team that, um, uh, that was put together to do the original family court building um, was one that was much more knowledgeable. And unfortunately in that one, politics included into the developer selection, um, which uh, people knew was never gonna come to fruition and it never did come to fruition. So there was a huge amount of time wasted uh, with the building staying empty. And I, I think there are developers in the city 
um, that could be engaged prior to going out with any uh, RFP in terms of, of getting the ideas and letting them tell you what the economics are of a project like this. Because uh, I think that, that the, the base of what Paul Stanky has put together, I think is, is, is a good start. And frankly, I think the building can stay exactly where it is, landscape the front of the, of the area and turn that into a, a, a park as well and get good, a, good, a couple of good coffee shops on the ground floor. And that's all you have to do and you get the stuff up above. Uh, but you gotta find some way to create some income and, and, and make the thing worth it and develop who's got some staying power. John Connors is another one uh, with Brickstone in terms of what he did when in the conversions that years ago he went through on, on the Wanamaker building. Um, there are people out there who think seriously about this and can, can do a good job. So I think too much emphasis on every public use they can get in there is not gonna get it funded in the long run. These groups just don't have the money, they can't raise the money and you need some private um, movement to make it work. One man's opinion. So I see Emmanuel Kelly waving his hand at the screen. You wanna unmute and, and follow up? Well, we'll keep watching you swing away at your screen there getting unmuted. But uh, once, once you get it, feel free to cut me off and, uh, and, and ask your question. Um, one question I did have uh, for Andy and Ian. Oh, Kelly, looks unmuted. like- I'm on now. Looks like we got you. Go for it. Follow up on what Craig said and Paul and Andy and Ian. Very interesting. One is that that proposal that Paul presented about building something on the the back side of the building, which is enough space to build a profitable um, uh, housing development for a uh, developer. Uh, I want to also say that. The, the suggestions of the ground floor, uh, opening that up outside to the plaza and landscaping it, uh, and that the main entrance and maybe some other for up above for housing could be could be done. But also the transformation of the idea, of the landscaping and opening up to connect to uh, Franklin Park that's across the way makes it much more attractive and, and so on. The Metropolitan Hospital, this is a question, was converted to housing, is that correct? Yes. So yes. the upstairs, and, and that has some of the form of, of the uh, original design. Uh, and so it's really, a, I see as a policy change uh, that's very important of connecting to Chinatown uh, that gets it, it's open, more uh, receptible, uh, sense of civicness, but really to the community relative to uh, other issues uh, that they have been surrounded with in the past. I think that's an important, whether or not all of, of the, uh, the building uh, can be converted to affordable housing. This is an economic uh, issue, but maybe that can happen on the front side uh, of the building. And uh, uh, the back property is the profitable side for the developers, some, some kind of combination. Speaking to the architecture, uh, all the comments have been said. Uh, Andy, I'm of a different opinion and agree with most of the comments that have been made about the building. It's precast. And if you think of Society Hill, it's the same thing. But we think of that positively because people are living there and so on in the association and the landscape. And all the associations with this of the past with the police department and so on, they need to be changed. So architecturally, it's not brutalism. And boy, the backside of this, the curvier form that's broken up and so on, you know, it's a, a delightful, from my perspective, modernist response. And I would, uh, uh, I see that uh, like Society Hill, the towers. Uh, there's a lot of detail and scale breakdown in those, uh, in that precast form. Uh, so I, I that's, think a that's good, it. Yeah, I think it's a good place to pivot back to Paul because uh, Tony Bercali, who made the, those sketches 
you know, abandoned us architects to, to move over to the development side. And he certainly understands the, the financial aspects of projects like this. So I just want to know, could you just remind us if there were any sort of financial discussions and constraints on what he was asked to do, or was, you know, was it just sort of a, a test fit of what could fit on site? Right. So we, we uh, just asked Tony to test what would fit on the site. We didn't, we didn't stress test for uh, the ability to finance it, uh, how many units it could yield, those kinds of things. I think we need Craig Shelter for that. So Craig, we might be calling you. Um, and David Brownlee is pointing out, I, I mentioned that uh, Northeast to Southwest Passage, which was Tony's idea to kind of create a pathway through the site from Chinatown into the east and north. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to mention another site of contested memory in the city that has been repurposed in a brilliant way, and that's Eastern State Penitentiary. Uh, you know, the Roundhouse had a prison in the basement. Eastern State was entirely a prison, and that has been converted not only into a major tourist attraction, as we all know, but as a place to explore uh, the phenomenon of over-incarceration uh, and of black and brown people in particular in uh, American society, lead the world. Uh, and so that's a, a place uh, that has a very dark past, also is an architectural landmark. The first building designed by an American that was copied in Europe is Eastern State Penitentiary. Uh, nevertheless, it has been repurposed by a brilliant team led by Sally Elk. I don't think she's on this call. Um, into something that the city can really be proud of. And I think that's what we're hoping can happen uh, with the Roundhouse. So Paul, can you, can you keep going? I think it, it's a good time to talk a little bit about, you know, trends within historic preservation and, and the discussion of place and events and what happened in a building uh, gaining momentum relative to purely architectural form making uh, and, and detailing. I, I think that's a, 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 an interesting juxtaposition in this building. I was wondering if you could say a little more about that and, you know, Eastern State Penitentiary is an excellent example, but are there, are there other examples? Are there anything that, that we should be thinking about differently when we just think of, of historic preservation and, and current trends? Right. So I think what you're referring to, Eli, um, is the effort to recognize uh, cultural heritage in addition to architecture and engineering. Um, and that is something that the preservation movement is grappling with and trying to address. Um, and the city of Philadelphia for its part uh, received a small grant from the William, William Penn Foundation to do a pilot program on uh, cultural heritage. Uh, and that is an effort being led by the Roz Group. Uh, and my understanding is they are finalizing uh, a neighborhood to focus on, and within that neighborhood to focus on the cultural heritage of that neighborhood, along with uh, its uh, architectural streetscape and built environment attributes. Preservation traditionally has focused on those things, and I think we're being called on to recognize cultural heritage as well. And probably a good time to plug a, a citywide survey. Uh, there you go. Uh, of, of these cultural resources, as well as those. Uh, Thank you, Bruce Corey, yes. for, for posting a link in the chat to what I was just referring to. Amanda, I, did I see you raising a hand there? Yeah, hi, thank you very much for this discussion. I just wanted to go back to the, I uh, did ask earlier the question about temporary use. When I hear a lot of the themes and the incredible um, community commitment and the six month process to for purposes of community engagement, I hear um, a, a sort of, we don't quite, we know what we think we want, we don't quite know what could work. And going back to temporary, temporary use suggests that there's a willingness to potentially experiment. And if you remove some of the pressure of going in all knowing, saying that we have to go in with these plans with these particular outcomes, therefore all knowing, you remove the sort of grace to experiment, to bring in community participants who potentially wouldn't necessarily have seen themselves in this projects to try something. 
And if they can try something, then you are informing potentially what you want those longer term uses to look like. And obviously what maybe fiscally can pencil and what organize, organization wise in terms of the architecture, what that might look like could also look like. So there are a lot of great ideas and I will put in, in the chat, a link to a project, um, the King's Cross project in London. This is a 200 year ground lease. The city never gave up ownership of the, of the land itself to a private developer, but a private developer has come in and they've staged the project and they've done interim temporary uses to help them inform the long-term use. Um, this particular parcel is in a, I would say has a wider scope of change given some of the other parcels around it that are currently in flux. So again, giving oneself the grace to kind of learn as you go along, but at the same time, not losing sight of what some of those community objectives are and potentially um, you know, creating some innovation around what it could be. Thank you so much. I'd love so someone to comment. Um, I love that idea myself because I think what will happen is this site is going to stay empty for some time until there's enough leadership and, and some funding to really make a difference. Um, I, I would guess a few years. So um, why not use some do some temporary uses? Um, that's going to take leadership as well to, to actually make a lease that makes sense for the city. Um, you know, if the attorneys get a hold of it, um, it probably won't happen now because uh, everybody's going to say there's too much liability involved in allowing somebody to use something temporarily. Um, but I, I think it, it would be a good uh, way to, to test. Yeah, Ian, I, I know that this is awfully putting you on the spot, but uh, care, care to comment? Yeah. I I think it's a very good idea. Um, it's not part of the plan right now, but I think it's a good idea to consider. Leave it at that. Um, so I, um, one question I, I do want to ask as we're, we're moving towards uh, the end of our time uh, for, for both Andy and then Ian more from the process side, we talked about the China, Chinese community as the, the near neighbors, but the, a lot of the uh, the scars and the wounds left by the building from the, the process photos that Ian showed is focused on the African-American community. So I just wanted to, to ask how, how those two communities collaborate uh, on this project and how uh, the conversations have gone throughout the, throughout the process and uh, if, if there are any thoughts that either of you have on that. Um, well, I'll just say it's a balance because there is this bigger issue of, of uh, what the building represented to a lot of people, but it is situated in a neighborhood. So I think you really still have to look at what is the best use for the building in the context of where it is, um, unless you want to make it a museum, which would be kind of useless to the neighborhood in some ways. Um, and I don't think that that's um, necessarily the highest and best use for this property. But there has to be recognition of what happened. So, like in the move bo bombing, there, uh, as Paul showed, there was a plaque that was put out there. But maybe something a little more than just the plaque. Um, maybe there could be a an interactive, um, you know, museum inside of it. But that, or inside of whatever is built. I'm not even. Uh, I'm not. We're not presuming that it's going to stay, but maybe it will. Kelly, uh, are you have a reaction? Uh, Amanda. Uh, raise some issues about, I mean, whatever happens is going to be phasing, but could the city as a beginning take down that perimeter wall and do some temporary landscaping so that people can, all over Chinatown, others can begin to imagine a change and see some possibilities. I mean, and in terms of liability, considerations would be less of a concern. You'd have to put up some temporary fence that you could see through, but. Yeah, I think Amanda's making her case to lead a new agency here in the city. Um, <laughs> That's all. David, David Brownlee, I, I saw your hand up and then I saw it disappear. Do you have a, a question for us? Uh, no, I, I really didn't, but I, I, did, I, I, I did want to emphasize that this is a very big site. 
and that one of the things that saved Eastern State was that it was possible to, for a period of time, really more than a decade, to experiment with bringing the public into the site and try to devise programs and activities that were relevant in some very substantial sense to the Fairmont neighborhood that surrounded it, as well as to the broader issues that are involved here. These built, this is a very durable building. It's, it's not as, it's, I mean, we have buildings where we need to intervene immediately because they're about to fall down that we'd like to try to figure out how to save. This is not one of those buildings. And the size of the site um, with the parking lot behind it and the possibility of integrating it with a, recon, a reconceived Vine Street and Franklin Square beyond it. These are really big ideas. And um, I mean, I think we, we owe it to ourselves to give us the room to think some of these big things through and make them work. The, the, the issues that, that, you know, that, that Andy speaks eloquently about and that we all, about the Chinatown community and that we all feel, feel very seriously about with respect to the, the, to what, to the, to the African-American community in Philadelphia, those are big and serious things. And they, 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 I think there is, I mean, I think the time is necessary to to develop confidence and support for um, for uh, for the solutions that we may come up with. And I do very, very much like the idea of trying to do something all seem to open it up, to take down the blank walls, to landscape it, to to begin to create a field in which one can imagine a, something better rather than just imagine something going away. So on that subject, um, I was just going back through the chat. Um, Adrian Scott Fine, do you want to unmute and, and walk us through your, your comment a little earlier about the Parker Center in LA? Because it, it, it's a, a good time in the conversation to talk about that as a, a similar precedent, but one that ended in, in demolition. Sure. Thanks, Eli. Um, and so I'm a former Philly person now in LA, so don't hold that against me. But Parker Center, I think, is uh, something worthy to look at in terms of uh, a very similar building, in terms of urban renewal, in terms of modernist architecture, a place that had the same police brutality issues associated with it in terms of difficult uh, history and also its impact on, in this case, the Little Tokyo community and very strong feelings about this building and what it did as a barrier um, in many ways. So it has very similar parallels and we went through the same kind of process in Los Angeles, um, having these conversations about what do you do with this building? How do you repurpose it? How do you honor um, its architecture, but also tell the story of what this building represents? And also thinking about, could it be housing? Could you add on to it? Could you make it uh, more receptive in terms of connectivity to, in this case, the Little Tokyo community? And went through all of those kinds of conversations, as well as uh, there was a, an open discussion about having the building landmarked as, a, as a, a, a local, in this case, Los Angeles Historic Cultural Monument. And I, I will spare you the, 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 you know, the, the long story, but ultimately the building was demolished and there wasn't the thoughtful conversation that I think a lot of the folks I'm hearing today talk about, about temporary uses or being creative and thinking about um, how you maybe would hold off on selling the building and thinking about how do you work with the community to actually craft a, a future for this structure in a way that really does uh, work for the community that is you know, there today. So the building was demolished, uh, nothing has replaced it, um, but I do think it is so similar to the Roundhouse in Philadelphia and the similar circumstances that I'd encourage you to look at it and again, learn from it and uh, think about how Philly can do better certainly than what LA did. Thank you, I appreciate that. That was, sure. that's, that's a helpful thing. And I think you meant to put some links in the chat. I didn't see them. So if you have them, put them in the chat so we can all, we can all grab them. Well um, because we're we're coming near the end of our time, I wanted to give uh, Ian, Andy, and Paul any sort of parting thoughts, parting uh, 
parting sentiments they'd like to share with us as we as we continue to think about this and, and move about our uh, our week and and go potentially walk around this site. Um, I just real quick, I just want to mention that um, some folks in some of the other communities, the black community, um, see that have have actually talked about tearing it down too because they see it as a very um, a symbol of the oppression, right? Um, so it's not just one group versus another or any. It, it, it is a mix of opinions all, all across the board. Um, so I, I just want to point that out. And lastly, um, just for Paul, I, uh, you know, if it, if it is historically certified, um, what does that mean to like things you can do on the outside, outer shell? If you want to, let's say, build a little uh, courtyard that in the front that, that would be, you know, where you could have shops and things like that. Was that possible? Or, you know, we've talked a little bit about that before. And it'll change the way it looks from the outside, but it'll keep the main structure intact. So the nomination uh, that we submitted to the Historical Commission along with Docomomo only uh, would govern the facade. It would not govern any of the interiors. Uh, so any alterations to the facade by a private a property owner, or even by the city, would have to go through the historical commission, and the, the uh, applicant would have to make their case for why any alterations are necessary, and then the commission would consider them against their uh, their guidelines. Uh, so it doesn't preclude uh, changes to the exterior. It certainly doesn't preclude uh, improvements to the landscaping and hardscaping around the building. Um, and I think as some of the participants in this call have said, those could go a long way to softening the building and making it more um, community friendly. But, but any construction of like new like glass enclosure or something would have to be uh, approved by the by a commission? In all likelihood, yes. If there's uh, additions being considered that might block views of the uh, historic building, then yes, the commission would have to review them. Again, I wouldn't want to prejudge any design because we don't have any, uh, but it, there would be a layer of review through the historical commission on any such uh, proposal. Ian, any closing thoughts for us? Uh, I just want to thank uh, Eli for doing a great job moderating. I know that wasn't easy. And and for everyone for their, their ideas and understanding sort of the position the city's in. Um, we really are trying to sort of go through this process thoughtfully um, and not discount, you know, any voices. And um, stay tuned to um, roundhousefutures.com. The final report, you know, from the Framing the Future Roundhouse process should be released in the coming month, uh, it, it's being translated into Spanish and, and simplified Chinese. Um, and, you know, stay tuned, I guess. Uh, and thanks for the ideas. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us. I am throwing that link right in the chat right now. Uh, so everyone can go check that out. Um, if, I, if I could just say one last thing, Ian. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank the city. Thanks to the city for being so open in this process. Uh, it's unusual, I think, for <laughs> some of the things that we've seen in the past. So appreciate that. And yeah, and for my part, I would echo that uh, for my part as well. Um, thanks to Eli, to Andy, to Ian. And I think what we've heard today are uh, other examples of buildings that were considered white elephants that have been or will be repurposed, 4601 Market, Eastern State Penitentiary, uh, the Family Court, 1801 Vine. I think they all provide models and lessons for the repurposing of uh, the Roundhouse. And I'm really glad to hear that there is uh, a, a strong, at least in this call, a strong sentiment to finding a way to thoughtfully repurpose the building, to acknowledge its dark past, and to uh, bring it into a much more uh, community friendly and um, progressive future. So I'm gonna do something that we haven't done before, but I'm going to, when we post the link to this, I'm also gonna publish the chat so that folks can see the chat and see those links and get after it. 
Um, Andy's going to get some hate mail about the Boston City Hall, but I think he can handle it. Um, so if you want to put yourself on camera, we will wrap up today with our, our virtual round of applause, uh, which uh, come next month we'll be able to do in person. So thank you. Thank you all for joining us. David Getty, thanks for jumping in. Uh, appreciate the, the feedback and the comments and everything. Um, so I am just sending a bunch of links in the chat now. Get your tickets. March 14th, next Tuesday, we'll all be in person um, for the mayoral forum. So that'll be uh, so that'll be at the at the uh, at the Kimmel Center, um, and that'll be a really good discussion with uh, the seven may uh, mayoral candidates who are sort of leading the way right now. Um, and then the other upcoming DAG events, April and May, as well as that DAG Urban Design Handbook. If you want to get involved, get in touch. Let us know uh, what you want to do and and what you want to be a part of. Thank you all and uh, enjoy your uh, your Thursday. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.